Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, also, feel free to interrupt me with any questions you might have during, uh, during the talk. Um, so I would like to uh, discuss all these topics that are in this uh, maybe too long title. Uh, but let's first give some motivation. So as most of you might know, even if you haven't worked with Lattices directly, um, is that most of this Lattice-based crypto currently is based on only a few assumptions, namely on LW, Sys, and Entru, and uh, the corresponding lattices that you, you build from these assumptions. And while these assumptions are very versatile, you can build many uh, cryptographic constructions with it, um, they are have quite poor decoding properties, so they don't have very good geometry. And at the same time, many wonderful lattices do exist uh, with great geometric properties. And of course, the natural question is, can we uh, use these in cryptography? And this has been tried before with quite ad hoc methods, uh, and these things also have been broken often by these by ad hoc attacks. So what we contribute is a general identification, encryption, and signature scheme uh, based on the lattice isomorphism problem. And with general, I mean you can put any lattice in there, uh, or at least lattice with certain properties, and you get out just an encryption scheme or a signature scheme in such a way that if you put in a better lattice, so a lattice that has better geometric or like decoding properties, you obtain a scheme that has uh, better fishy and security. Okay, so that's kind of the, the motivation behind this. This enables us to use special lattices instead of just using these LW, Sys, and true lattices. Okay, some background, what is a, a lattice? Well, you can just look at it as given any, any uh, basis over the reals. You can look at all intercombinations of these basis factors, and that gives you uh, a lattice. And note that such a basis is not unique. You could have an uh, infinite number of, of different bases for the same, same lattice. And I was talking about these geometric properties. So let's uh, discuss a few. So probably the most important one is the first minimum of a lattice, which is the, the minimum length of a non-zero uh, lattice factor. Another way to look at this is as the minimum distance between any two distinct lattice points. And we denote this by this lambda one of the of the lattice. Uh, and the second geometric properties property that I will discuss is the determinant of a lattice. So if you look at the the real space up to the translation action of the of the of the lattice, then you can uh, give some fundamental domain with respect to this action. And this fundamental domain doesn't matter how you choose; it always has the same uh, volume. And, or at least the same absolute uh, volume. And that's what we call the determinant of, of a lattice. Okay, and we have these two uh, geometric properties. And you can ask, like, how are these related? And Minkowski already gave an answer to this uh, long ago. And he said that the first minimum is at most uh, some quantity that depends on the, the normalized determinant um, divided by some, some, some constant that depends on the dimension. And you can just look at this at, as something that's of the order square root n uh, times the normalized determinant. So this is up to constants. This is uh, up to constant fact factors. This is uh, type. Um, OK, so Minkowski gives an upper bound of the first minimum in terms of this determinant. And to do cryptography in, uh, with lattices, we need some, some hard problems. So what are the, the most common hard problems? Well, first, we have the shortest vector problem. Uh, known as SVP, uh, where given any basis of a lattice, your goal is to recover uh, the short a, a shortest non-zero vector uh, of this lattice. Um, and secondly, which is kind of the inhomogeneous version of this problem, you have the bounded disk decoding problem. So here you are given a uh, target in the space, and your and and that lies somewhat close to to the lattice. So you are given the promise that this error lies at uh, this at most some, some row from the lattice. And this problem asks you to recover the closest uh, lattice point. And these two problems, they don't seem very hard in, in dimension two, but if you increase the dimension, they become very, very hard. So the best algorithms are all exponential in this uh, dimension. 
Um, but if you look at the concrete hardness of these problems, so if you would fix the dimension and just look at how hard is, are these problems uh, really with the best algorithms that we know, then it also depends on this uh, gap that you have. So in the case of the shortest vector problem, if the gap between this first minimum and the upper bound that the Minkowski uh, bound gives you is very large, which means that your first minimum is your shortest factor is much shorter than what you would expect. Uh, then this problem becomes easier. And similarly, for the bound density coding problem, if this gap is large, so this row is much smaller, then your let your your target lies much closer to your lattice, which makes it easier to uh, recover. Okay, so the hardness depends on, on the size of, of these gaps. So how do we now uh, do encryption with uh, these, these problems? And for the sake of this call, talk, let's call this the, the, the legacy approach, but that's like the approach that this is a high level view of what we currently do. Um, so the idea is that we have on one side a good secret basis, and on the other side, a bad public basis. And with good, I mean that the vectors are somewhat short and orthogonal. And with bad, I mean that the vectors are somewhat large and not so orthogonal. And note that it's hard to go from this basis to, to this basis, as you would need to find a short vector. So that's the, the SVP problem. Um, and also note that any pair of such bases is, um, is, is connected by each other by some unimolar transformation. So some uh, insert matrix uh, with determinant plus minus one. Um, but of course, like there are an infinite number of these unimolar transformations to, to get different bases. Okay, so what can we now do with this good basis to, to do cryptography? Well, given such a good basis, we also have a decoding algorithm, uh, namely the bias nearest plane algorithm. And I'm not going to explain how it precisely works, but what it does, it, it subdivides your space into some fundamental uh, domains. And if you run the wise nearest plane algorithm with this good basis, then any point that falls in the box is uh, rounded to the, the lattice point that lies in the center of this box. And essentially, if this box is very uh, well square, then this gives a very good decoding algorithm. Well, if your box is like this, then you would have a point maybe here and that gets rounded to, to this point. And while, while definitely this point lies, lies much closer. Um, so using this, this good secret basis, you can, can decode somewhat uh, well. So now to, to encrypt a message, given the public uh, key, we just encode our message as some, some lattice point. We can do that because we, we have a public basis. And then to encrypt it, it's very simple. You just add a small error to it. And using the, the public basis, we can't easily decode this because if you would do the Babai reduction algorithm, sorry, Babai decoding algorithm with the public base, you get a different message back. And in high dimensions, this like becomes, uh, it becomes the glitcher ball that you actually recover your, your original message. But if you have a good basis, then you do recover. Uh, the original message, if your error wasn't uh, too big. So where do these LWE and NTRUE and, and SIS assumptions come in? Well, that's exactly, uh, the, the, they are used to construct this uh, lattice, this kind of a random lattice, together with such a, a good basis. So what, what for example, NTRUE gives you is a somewhat random lattice together with this, this short basis. And then you can use this by decoding to, to do uh, your encryption. Okay, but there is a, a problem with this, this approach of, of using by decoding or other decoding algorithms that depend on this, this good basis. Uh, namely that this decoding gap that you obtain, so that the, which, which influences the hardness of the problem, uh, is at least of uh, size square root of n. It doesn't matter how good your basis is, you will always get the gap of at least this, this square root n. And because uh, this gap is so large, it's also easier to, to actually forge, uh, like to, to decrypt just using, using attacks or to, for example, recover uh, the key. In fact, if you do uh, use a lattice in dimension n, then, and you have this gap, then to 
to solve it, you kind of only need to solve SAP in dimension uh, about n over 2. So in practice, this means that if you look at, for example, the signature scheme Falcon, uh, it uh, uses dimension 1024, but to break it, we only need to solve SAP in dimension 440. And the hardness, like the, the, the algorithms are exponential in this, in this beta that we, we have here. So that means that we just lost like a square root um, complexity to, to break it. So we halve the bit size in terms of security. Um, so can we do better than this, this uh, square root of n? Well, yes, we can. For example, we have this, this prime lattice. This was already in the, in the core Rivest uh, paper in 1988, although it wasn't very uh, clear that it was in there. Um, but with this lattice, you can actually efficiently decode up to a large radius just by some smart uh, trial division uh, tricks. And in fact, if you tune all the parameters right, you can uh, get a gap that's only logarithmic in this dimension n. And if you would have such a gap, then decoding it with, with any like uh, attack uh, would mean that beta is not about n over 2, but beta would be close to n, actually. So you double the, the, the security. Um, OK, but now let's go back to this, this picture of, of encrypting. Um, before, we had this, this somewhat random lattice together with a good base that was secret. But now we assume we have some good lattice, for example, this, this prime lattice. Um, and definitely, it can't be a secret key anymore, because everyone, everyone knows it. We assume that we have picked some very cool lattice, and we assume that everyone just knows this lattice. Um, so even if we give like a bad base away, it, it's, everyone just knows it. So we need to find some way to hide uh, the structure of this, of this good lattice. Um, and as I mentioned, this has been tried before. But for example, by uh, permuting the coefficients. And the problem with this is that if you just only permute the coefficients, uh, you enable a lot of attacks from uh, like more information set decoding attacks from the decoding theory side. Um, and all these schemes were broken by, by abusing the fact that they only use these, these permutations. Um, in fact, we want to, to scramble this matrix, this lattice up, but we don't want to destroy its geometry because the geometry is what we, we actually use to, to get good decoding. Um, and if you phrase it like this, there's only one possibility that you can do. Namely, we can apply a uh, arbitrary uh, isometry to this, to this lattice. And in the, in the space of lattices, all the isometries are exactly given by this orthonormal transformations. So these permutations of the coefficients that they tried before, they are also isometries, but that's just a very small uh, subgroup of this, of, of the full group of, of isometries. Um, so instead of giving a public key of, of the known lattice, we give a public key of like a, a bad basis of the, a, a rotated version of this, of this lattice. Um, and then the encryption just goes as, as usual. Uh, someone picks a message here, adds a small error. If you know this transformation, which is secret, you are in the world of this, this good lattice in which you can decode. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's the assumption. Um, and then if you decode here, you can use orthonormal transformation to, to turn back. And you recover the, the message. OK, so to break this, you would need to, to recover this, this orthonormal transformation. And that's exactly uh, a very old lattice problem, namely the lattice isomorphism problem. So given two lattices, this la lattice isomorphism problem asks you to recover this orthonormal transformation that maps one lattice uh, to the other. Um, if we looked at this in terms of uh, just the, the basis of a, if a lattice, then you get the following. Given any uh, two like pair of bases uh, B and B prime, um, we need to find such an orthonormal transformation, and in addition, some unimolar transformation, so that's the base transformation, just that B prime is equal to O times B times U. And it seems that like the, the presence of these two transformations is what makes the, the problem hard. If, if any of these two would be trivial, then recovering the other would also be simple uh, linear algebra. But the presence of these two, uh, yeah, 
kind of makes it uh, a hard problem. Okay, so what do we uh, what do we know about uh, this problem? Um, let's first let me say that it's kind of uh, the lattice analog of the very original uh, Macaulay scheme. So currently Macaulay is done in quite a, a different way, but if you look in the in the very original paper by Macaulay, um, then you get this idea that you have some generator matrix of a good decodable code, and you scramble it up by applying a random permutation and a random uh, basis transformation. And note that the permutations in terms of uh, codes and the Hamming weight are exactly the full group of isometries. But when we go from codes to, to lattices, we have to not only consider permutations, but also like the full group of isometries, which are orthonormal transformations. Uh, and similar, if you look at the oil vinegar scheme, um, you have some quadratic maps that you hide by some affine invertible uh, matrix. So maybe it doesn't look exactly the same right now, but if you write this in a <laughs> different way, as we will say later, then it's, it's basically the same, same principle. Um, and what is very, very good for us to, to build cryptography on it, the best known attacks that we, we have require you to, to solve uh, SCP first. So all the, the, the best algorithms that we have for this, this Z-Azurvision problem have as a first step uh, compute the shortest factors of, of the lattice. Um, because what, like, how do these algorithms uh, look in general? Um, if you have the set of short, shortest factors of, of one lattice and you have the set of shortest factors from the other lattice, because it's isometry, it maps the one set to the, to the other. Um, and these sets are finite. So what we could just do in practice is we could try to find all the isometries between these, these finite sets. And of course, you can optimize this a bit by, uh, by some backtrack search where you uh, stop as soon as things can't continue anymore. Um, and for the best proven algorithm, we don't, don't only need short primal vectors, but even also short uh, dual vectors. And that's the, the best proven bound we have is n to the, to the on. But even if you ignore all of this, you always need to first enumerate these shortest factors. And that's, well, we just assume that if you find a short factor, you can maybe solve lib, but at least it's as hard as finding uh, a shortest factor. Why do you have to be the shortest So it doesn't necessarily have to be, but um, the thing is if you, look at all the vectors of a specific length, if you increase this length, you often have like many, many more of these, of these vectors. And then the problem of mapping these sets to each other, like the number of isometries that you would have to try grows enormously. So um, in practice, it's, it's the fastest to just take the, the shortest ones. Um, but yeah, uh, it depends on a lot of factors, of course. This is a bit of a of simplification. But um, if you would also like need to enumerate all the factors of a given length, uh, that's not much easier than just enumerating the the shortest ones. Like if you would, and and if you just enumerate like one long vector here and one long vector here, there is almost zero chance that they actually can be mapped uh, to each other. But yeah, I mean, it's a whole interplay with also the number of automorphisms and things quickly become uh, complicated. But uh, uh, I haven't seen an example so far where this is not the fastest way of, of solving it. Okay, um, so let's try to turn this into any like a uh, real practical uh, scheme and give some solid foundations uh, to using this problem. And we kind of have two, two challenges. Well, this orthonormal transformation and this, this unimodal transformation. And this orthonormal transformation is defined over the reals. And if you want to do any practical implementations, then, then real numbers are not something you actually want to, to work with. Um, and this unimodal transformation needs to be sampled in some way. Um, and note that this group is this like infinite, so you can't just say sample it uniformly, like it doesn't have any, any meaning. Um, but we need to sample this unimodal transformation in such a way that there is no real, that this, this B prime doesn't leak any, any information about your original basis. 
So there has been, uh, recently there has been a work by I think Blanks and Miller, where they just try different ways of generating uh, this U. And in fact, there are like, uh, if you do it kind of naively and, and generate this U, then sometimes you can create like weak instances of this, this lib column where you can always uh, maybe just run LL and, and suddenly you recover this original basis back from, from B prime. Um, and the only way to make this really solid is to make sure that this B prime we sample is completely independent of, of B, except that it's, it's uh, is isomorphic to it. But uh, other than that, we want it to be independent. Okay, so let's first focus on this autonomous transformation and then on this, this unimolar transformation. So in fact, if you look at the literature on this lattice isomorphism problem, then this is already a, a solved problem. Um, because what we do is we completely ignore this orthonormal transformation by moving to not the, the base of a lattice, but the Gram matrix of a, of a lattice. So a Gram matrix of a lattice basis is just uh, all the pairwise inner products between the basis vectors. So uh, by the way, the basis vectors are like uh, column vectors. So B transpose B is like all the pairwise inner products. Um, and if you do this, then you see that this orthonormal transformation just cancels uh, out. And we get only an equation in terms of the Gram matrix of one basis and the Gram matrix of another basis. Of course, at the cost of adding another uh, unimolar transformation. Um, like it's now on both sides, not just one side. So in fact, what we did here is uh, instead of working with lattices, we moved to the quadratic form setting where this, this positive definite matrix defines a positive definite real uh, quadratic form. Um, and how you can see is this is as you, you keep all the geometric information, you keep all this information about the onion products, but you forget about the specific embedding of your lattice. So um, we can go from the basis to a quadratic form, but going back, you could do that, but then only up to some, some orthonormal uh, transformation. Um, another way to view this is that for lattices, you always have, have some embedded lattice in, in the reals together with the Euclidean inner product. Well, for quadratic forms, you always work with the lattice C to the N, but now your inner product is defined with respect to the, um, to the quadratic form. And this allows us to completely restate uh, lib as the following problem given two uh, of these e equivalent quadratic forms. Uh, find this unimolar transformation such so that Q prime is equal to U transpose Q U. And if we also just uh, restrict ourselves to using quadratic forms that are, let's say, integer, then this is a completely uh, integer problem. So we got rid of all floating points or even uh, rational numbers. Okay, um, now about this, this unimolar transformation. So we need to sample this unimolar transformation such that Q prime doesn't leak anything about uh, this particular Q. Um, and we can revert this problem by just saying, okay, we want to sample some Q prime from uh, this equivalence class. So, and, and even if you put Q in, this Q prime should only depend on this equivalence class. So what we did is we defined a distribution on this equivalence class together with some parameter uh, sigma. And where this sigma kind of indicates how bad your basis is. So if you make, put in like a large sigma, then you get a, a bad basis. If the sigma is small, you get a basis of, of certain factors. Um, and in addition, what we give is an efficient sampler that gives both this, this so you put in any, any uh, Q and you get a Q prime from this distribution. Uh, along with such a unimolar transformation that maps uh, from Q to Q prime. Um, but this Q prime only depends on this, this class and not on, on, on Q itself. Um, and note that to do this efficiently, uh, this sigma has to be large enough compared to your, your input uh, Q. But if this sigma is really large enough, you can always sample from it by, uh, well, first using uh, LL reduction. And in short, what this, this gives you is both an average gauge definition of, of the lib problem, 
Uh, and this in turn implies a zero knowledge proof of knowledge of, of knowing an isomorphism. And that gives you an identification scheme. I will talk about this more in the next slide. Um, but maybe more important, we get a worst case to average case reduction over this uh, class. Uh, and that means that if we pick this, um, this sigma appropriately, then we can prove that if you can solve these average case lib instances, uh, then you can also solve the worst case instances over this uh, uh, class. So if we pick our public key from this average case instance, then we know there's nothing sketchy going on. Like there's no way that if you can solve these, then you can solve any instance of the lib problem inside of this, this class. Okay, so how do we, uh, would you define such an average case uh, uh, problem? Well, one way to do that is saying, we are given some, some Q and you're given some Q prime from this average case uh, distribution, recover this unimolar transformation that uh, connects these two. And this, um, you can always sample this, do, like construct these things efficiently if your sigma is large enough compared to some input form Q. And if sigma is like exponentially large, then you can always sample uh, from it. So this zero knowledge proof of knowledge that I, I mentioned. So the, the question is, given public uh, some public forms Q0 and Q1 um, from the, the same class, we want to, I, I, I know some, or some, some unimodular tra transformation that maps one to the other, and I want to prove to any of you uh, that I know it, but I don't want to reveal it to you. Um, and that can be done with a, using this, this uh, distribution, you can, in the sampler, you can do this via simple uh, sigma protocol, where um, you use your sampler to get a sample, a new Q prime from this distribution, along with this unimodular transformation V. And now, if you know this, or this unimodular transformation between Q0 and Q1, you can also easily construct uh, a, 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 a isomorphism between Q1 and, and this Q prime. So if I'm, I'm honest, if I really know it, then I can easily construct this. And then a challenger would say, okay, um, return either V to me or return uh, this isomorphism to me. And if you can answer this with a non glitchable advantage, so with half plus something uh, polynomial, um, then that means that you could answer them at the same time with some non glitchable uh, uh, probability. And that means that you can recover U. Like if you know this one and you know this one, you can recover U. Or maybe not precisely U, but you can at least recover always a, a unimodular transformation between these two. Um, and if you just, you can just repeat that to improve the soundness and that gives you a, a zero knowledge proof. We haven't leaked any, any information uh, about this original uh, U. Uh, and this in turn gives you an identification scheme by uh, quite standard transformations. Um, but as I mentioned, maybe more importantly, we have this worst case or average case reduction. So suppose we have any Q and Q prime that are equivalent. And we are given the problem of, of so finding this, this isomorphism between the two. But what we can always do is if, if this, uh, so if the sigma is exponentially large in compared to this uh, original form, we can always sample some Q pr uh, prime prime um, together with this unimodular transformation. And what we then have between our original Q and this Q prime prime is a average case uh, instance. Now, if we can solve this instance, then we can also recover a solution for this just by going, by following the diagram uh, around. Uh, which means that if we can solve these average case instances, then we can solve any uh, worst case uh, instance. Um, so sampling your public key from, uh, from the average case distribution gives you uh, yeah, a solid foundation uh, that nothing funny is, is going on. Okay, um, so these are, this was more of a, a technical slide. Uh, let's see how we can, can break it and how these, these things really, um, what are the concrete securities that we know, like what are the best attacks that, that we know currently? Well, the best known attacks all use just generic lattice reduction. So 
as I mentioned before, to solve lib, we always have to find short factors first. Um, so to find these short factors, we know that the complexity of this, the hardness of this depends on this, this gap uh, in the primal. So this lattice that we put in there is just some, some decodable lattice. Um, but in fact, you, another way to do it, if, if two lattices are isomorphic, then their duals are also isomorphic. So instead of trying to find the isomorphism in the primals, we can also try to find it in the duals. So we also have to make sure that this gap, the dual gap, is not uh, too large. And then finally, we could also just try to decode it. And that depends on this uh, decoding gap. So these are really the three geometric properties that we want to have uh, small in order to uh, make this, this scheme more secure. So what kind of decodable lattices can we, can we plug in here? Um, well, I mentioned before this prime lattice. And as you see, we have this, this logarithmic uh, uh, decoding, and that's, that's all good. But unfortunately, if you go to the dual, we still have this, this square root of n uh, gap there. So we could instantiate our, our scheme with this prime lattice, but then still you would be able to do key recovering by going to the dual uh, and solving SP in dimension n over 2 instead of, instead of n. Um, and as you might see, these constructions are, like we have more of these lattices that even go to square root login, uh, and all these constructions are very, very recent. Uh, but unfortunately, they all have this square root of n gap in the dual. And that's actually just because they get constructed from, from codes, like you have some, some good decodable code, and then they use like these constructions A, D, or uh, all those things. And those kind of always give you this, this square root n. But there's no reason why, there's no geometric reason why you wouldn't be able to, to have all these things uh, uh, small. For example, if you just take a, a random lattice, then these gaps are, are constant. Uh, but of course, in a random lattice, we, we can't decode unless we have some good basis. Okay, let's look at some other candidates. So this n through other v, what I mentioned, uh, well, we do have these, these square root of n uh, gaps there. But interestingly, if you just look at uh, the lattice c to the n, uh, c to the n has determinant 1, and Minkowski bound is something like, like square root of n. So we get this square root of n, n gap there. But also we can very efficiently decode in this, this lattice, but also at this square root of n uh, decoding gap. But like how you could interpret this is that n through n all the v is these lattices aren't really better than, than just the, the simplest trivial lattice c to the n in terms of uh, performance. Um, and can we do better? Yes, we at least there's one lattice for which we know we can do better, and that's the Barnes wall lattice where all these gaps are the fourth root uh, of n, and we have an efficient algorithm to, to decode. Okay, so to zoom in a bit, to, to get some concrete numbers, what are the interesting, case, interested case, interesting cases? Well, we have c to the n. It's very similar in geometry to the n true and l we lattices, but of course, it's extremely simple uh, to, to decode. Like decoding in c to the n is just rounding uh, in the individual coefficients. And if you want to break it, the, the best attack also uses these, like in, for n is 1024, we still have the square root gap, so we get this beta of around n over 2 uh, is equal to 440. And if we look at the same for this uh, barned wall lattice, which has better geometry, like smaller gaps, uh, and also better decoding capabilities, uh, then we see that this beta suddenly increases to about 710. So we do cryptography in, in lattices of the same dimension, but suddenly to break it, we need to solve SAP in like 250 dimensions uh, higher. And this severely, like in, this, this just means that if you would build a scheme on this, uh, you would get a much higher bit security uh, compared to C to the N or, or L to B and N through for the same dimension. Uh, and of course, the, the, the holy grail that we don't have at the moment is that someone needs to construct a lattice where all these gaps are, uh, are small, both in the primal and dual, and you can uh, decode, because that would imply that this beta is around uh, n. So if this is the case, then you might be able to do, do cryptography at similar security levels as, as that we currently have, but then in a, in a lattice of only dimension, say, a five, 500. And that makes everything smaller and, and more efficient. 
Okay. Um, so I want to uh, dive a bit deeper even in the C to the N because we try to actually make a concrete instantiation of a not an encryption scheme, but a signature scheme uh, based on C to the N to show that it can be competitive with all the, the current state of the state of the art. And this signature scheme that we named Hawk, um, it should soon, ap soon appear uh, on, on ePrint. E um, but it's quite simple in, the, in how it works. We hash the message to a, a target in the space. And the signature is just some nearby lattice point. So it doesn't have to be the, the closest lattice point. It just has to be somewhat close. Um, and to verify the signature, you just check if, if it's indeed close and, and that's when you, what you accept. And this is exactly how, for example, Falcon uh, currently works. Um, and by the way, you have this Gaussian sampling here. Um, that's just needed to make sure your signatures don't leak any information about your, your, your lattice uh, or your, your good basis. Uh, but you can just think about like finding a nearby uh, lattice point. But Falcon uh, does this exactly, but then with n through lattices. And they sample by using a, a good basis. If you have a good basis, you can also do this bye bye procedure, but you can randomize it a bit, uh, which gives you this, this discrete Gaussian uh, sampler. And the problem with, with Falcon is that it's to do this using these n through lattices, um, you need to have a lot of high precision floating point uh, operations. And high precision floating point operations are like on modern PCs and stuff, you, you have them, but if you look at low end hardware, uh, you don't have them. And also this, these algorithms are quite complex. So the, the amount of code that is in Falcon is, is huge. Um, and because of this, this high precision uh, floating point stuff, Falcon might never be able to be implemented really well on, on like low end uh, devices. So can we, uh, can we get rid of this? Um, and well, we could try because doing the sampling in C to the N is again almost uh, trivial. You can just do it at, for each coefficient uh, separately um, and you don't need all of this, this high precision floating point. And one, though this may not say much to you, but if you just look at kind of the, the relative quality of these, these samples, then Falcon uh, reaches about 1.17, which is, is quite good, but it comes at this enormous uh, cost. Um, at the same time, recently there was this Mitika scheme that tried to uh, very much simplify this and remove all these floating point uh, operations. But this does come at, at the cost of, of a, a, a worse quality, like a large number means here, means that your signatures, that uh, the lattice points you sample are farther away, uh, which makes forgeries uh, easier. And well, with Hawk, we had the same goal of simplifying it, but we just simplify by using C to the N. Uh, and as a benefit, we even get a slightly smaller quality, like a better quality than, than Falcon. Um, yeah, this is a f a quite a full slide with, with things. But of course, if you just use C to the N, things don't become efficient. If you would need to, if you have C to the N and you have some, some credit form of it, this is a N by N uh, matrix. So that's going to be way, way too large. So um, to make it all efficient, we need to add some structure to it, such as all these lattice-based schemes do. So instead of considering uh, lib, we consider a module lib. So uh, we don't look at CTDN as, as lattice, but what we do is we look at this uh, cyclotomic uh, ring of powers of two. And if you look at a rank two module in this, namely R squared, then this is just exactly the same as if you would embed it later, then you would exactly get C to the CTDN. Um, secondly, we need to find some way to sample this unimodal transformation, but then for, for modules. Um, and funnily enough, you get something that's very similar to Andrew and, and Falcon. Namely, we need to sample some, some random unimolar transformation. Um, note that for, for C to the N, you can just start at the identity. So this B here is, is basically this U that we, we saw before. And what we do is we sample these F and G just from some, 
like ternary or some from some small discrete uh, Gaussian. And then we complete the, the basis by finding these big F and G, such as the determinant of the whole thing is, is one, if that is uh, possible. And this is exactly what also Entrue does to construct a, a base of Entrue lattice. But there they don't have this determinant as one, but they have the determinant equal to some power of, of Q, because these are our Q area lattices. But funnily enough, we can reuse most of the code of, of Falcon to, to do this, the, the key generation. So this public key then becomes this quadratic form given by these, uh, these bases. And this quadratic form is also can be compressed further because it's like it's symmetric, for example, so you can throw uh, parts away. Uh, we know that the determinant is one, so you get some dependencies between the, 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 the elements, uh, which allows you to throw away uh, even more. And uh, you have some of these elements are self-adjoint, which means that you can throw away half of the, you can represent them in, in half the number of coefficients. Um, and as another trick, what we do is we don't hash to any target, but we only hash to these uh, kind of binary uh, cosets. And last but not least, and this is quite a big compression step, is that we can drop half the signature and recover it using only uh, public key information. So if you're not really into all these uh, deep details, uh, then I'm sorry for the slide, but... Uh, yeah, we do a lot to really try to get everything out of it. Um, so we also tune these parameters just based on actual concrete uh, crypt analysis. I mean, this is exactly the, all the other schemes also do this. Like if you look at, for example, Falcon, they don't have any uh, provable security using their specific parameters, uh, but they just optimize it based on the concrete crypt analysis that we, we have. So then what do we get? Um, that's one big table, but here we have the, the, the timings for and the sizes for Falcon in the level one security. And here we, we have HOG. So what you see is that if we look at the AVX2, so that's the implementation that you would have on, on regular uh, computers, um, then we have uh, a key gen that is twice as fast, uh, signing that is four times as fast, and verification that is uh, more than two and a half times as, as fast as Falcon. Um, and now if we, oh, and also by the way, the, the size, so we have somewhat similar, slightly smaller secret key. Uh, our public key is about a hundred bytes larger, but our signatures are about a hundred bytes, uh, shorter. And now let's have a look at this, this reference key gen and reference, uh, sign. Um, these are the implementations that, uh, can also run on devices that don't have any floating point uh, capacity. So that can only, they can only use, use integers. Um, and then we see that this, this sing signing of, of Falcon becomes very expensive. As soon as you don't have any floating points, you need to kind of em emulate them. Uh, and, and yeah, that, that costs you uh, a lot. And compared to, to Falcon, we don't have to do all this, these high precision floating points. So we win here by like a factor 12. On, on the signature. Um, but if you look at this, this is a bit disappointing because at the, at the, at the verification, uh, we do need actually to use floating points and we get quite a, a still, we still, and overall it's still like a factor two smaller, but it's still quite high. Uh, and this is only because of this last compression. So just dropping off the signature and recovering it, that's where we need to, to use floating points. Um, but at the same time, this signature part is, is the part where uh, you use secret key information. So if you would implement, like most of these low-end devices are really like chips that need to be uh, protected. Um, and it's really the signature part that, that needs to, the signing part that needs to be protected. And um, protecting all these, these floating point operation by masking and stuff is, is very, uh, very hard. Like it's probably almost impossible uh, for Falcon. Uh, and while we, for us, it's very simple and you can, can quite easily probably do that. Um, and for the verification, you only use public key information, so it doesn't need to have all this masking. Um, so probably for, for real-world implementations in these low-end devices, uh, this is still preferably what you 
have like the, the load should be on the verification. Yeah? Um, but in order to also get rid of this, we also have a version where we don't do this uh, compression. So we do lose on the on the signature size then, but then our signing and verification are are extremely fast. Like uh, in total, is like about 400 microseconds. Well, Falcon is about uh, well almost 2,500 um, microseconds. Okay. Uh, so to conclude, if you take any lattice, we can turn it into identification scheme by the zero knowledge uh, proof of knowledge. If you take any decodable lattice, you can turn it into an encryption scheme. And if you take any Gaussian sampleable lattice, you can turn it into a signature scheme, where the security of these schemes only depends on the original geometry of, of the lattice you, you put in there. And CTDN already seems enough to, to match or even beat the state of the art uh, with LDB and true uh, assumptions. But of course, our end goal is to, to do even better, to have even better lattices to put in there to obtain higher securities uh, in similar dimensions. So thanks for listening and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs>